It's a real pleasure to be welcoming you to our virtual homecoming. I'm hoping that by homecoming next year, we'll be in a situation where we can do this again in person. Uh, but, but this year, it's great to have, have us connecting this way. Uh, my name is Matt Davison, and I'm the Dean of Science at Western University. I'm so thrilled to see everybody here. While we are gathered virtually today, I wish to acknowledge the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Nalepawak, and the Attawandaran peoples whose traditional lands encompass Western University. Western is committed to recognizing and furthering our relationships with Indigenous communities, and this verbal acknowledgement pays respect to the original peoples of the territory upon which the university is physically located, as well as recognizing the ongoing presence of Indigenous peoples in educational settings. This Thursday, September 30th, is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and I encourage you to join, in our join us in our obser observance of this day in the knowledge that advancing truth and reconciliation is a responsibility that belongs to all of us. I have been very pleased to see campus alive with activity as we have welcomed back our students to in-person learning. The start of the school year was not what we hoped for, and we are working diligently with our campus partners to ensure that our students are receiving a variety of supports during these challenging times. So homecoming is a great tradition for Western University, and we are really thrilled to continue for the second year now our tradition of science talks, where we have the Zoom lectures from some of our most eminent scientists doing some of our most exciting research. Um, both of the talks today are going to be highlighting some really impactful research that uh, represents highlight areas for our faculty. So we're going to have two incredible talks. I'll introduce them as they come. And we'll have a little bit of time for question and answer, a quick question and answer period at the end. And if you think you have a question, if you'd like to ask a question, please write it into the Zoom chat to me, Matt Davison and our speakers will do their best to answer your questions. Okay, so with those ground rules aside, uh, our first speaker is Dr. Gord Oz Ozinski, and Oz will be presenting a talk on why space matters. Oz is a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences, the interim director of the Institute for Earth and Space Exploration, and the director of the Canadian Lunar Research Network. Oz is one of our most prominent researchers and uh, internationally renowned expert in planetary science. Welcome, Oz. Thanks, Matt, for that introduction, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So let me share my screen, and we'll get this talk underway. Okay, so maybe, Matt, you can just confirm my slides are looking good. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here this morning at this virtual homecoming event. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, about space, why I think it matters, uh, touch on some of the exciting things on the horizon, uh, both for Canada and for Western, because in the past few years, Western has really become an epicenter for space-related research uh, here in Canada and internationally. So typically, if we were in a room together, which again, as Matt noted, hopefully next year we'll be doing that, uh, I usually would start this kind of talk by asking you about, you know, what's the first thing that pops into your head when I just say the word space? You know, so for many of you, and maybe we have some astronomy alumni here, uh, maybe it's an image like this. So this is one of the iconic images from the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. This is a deep field images. And if you had the time to count, um, there's about 3,000 kind of points of light in this image. And you know, what do you think they all are? Well, if you look closely, you know, maybe you think they're stars, but some of them are disc shaped. And so maybe the solar systems like our own. So each one of these is a star with planets around. Uh, but in fact, every one of these bits of light on this screen is an entire galaxy. So something like our Milky Way with billions of stars and billions of planets. And so, you know, even to me who studies space for a long time, this is simply mind boggling to think about, you know, what is out there in the universe? You know, is there life out there? Some of these big questions that we're trying to tackle here at Weston. Perhaps when I mention space, uh, you think of images such as this, and perhaps uh, some of you uh, were there to witness, you know, at least on the TV, black and white TV screen, this uh, iconic moment on July 20th, uh, 1969. 
where Neil Armstrong became the first person, the first human, to step foot on any other planetary object. Uh, it's been a long time since we've done this. As a human species, 1972 was the last time we walked on another planetary object. Um, but as I'll get to in a few slides time, um, we really are seeing a resurgence of this and we should have humans back on the moon in perhaps two or three years time. Perhaps when you think of space, it might be the International Space Station. You know, you can get a glimpse of this on a clear night sometimes if it passes on the right trajectory overhead. Um, this, you know, truly is a, an international effort. And for 21 years now, we've had a permanent human presence in space. You know, so people talk about as becoming a spacefaring species. I would argue that we're actually already there. So every day, 365 days a year, 24-7 uh, since uh, 2000, uh, the year 2000, the millennium, um, we've had people living on this space station with its kind of football uh, pitch size solar panels. When I think of space, um, I often come back to this, uh, another iconic graphic that the European Space Agency uh, produced uh, several years ago. I like this because it, you know, captures a lot of different things, um, you know, where we've come from, where we're going, and how interwoven the exploration of the land, the sea, the ocean, uh, the air, and space is. You know, space to me is a natural uh, progression of exploring our own planet. Um, you know, and it is amazing to think of where we've come from. Uh, I do a lot of research, and we were just talking about this before we started up in the Canadian Arctic, and I read a lot of uh, kind of Arctic and Antarctic exploration literature. You know, a little over a century ago, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but we were still exploring and trying to get to the poles of this planet by sailing ship. Right. So just in a century, so much has changed. We then took to the air in the earlier part of the last century to space in the mid part of the last century. And then, you know, who knows where we're going uh, even in the next decade, let alone the next century. Um, lots of things in the news with respect to space, of course. You know, just last week we had Inspiration4, um, the first ever civilian, purely civilian space flight. And then actually earlier next year, there's going to be a Canadian on board, the first ever fully private space flight to the International Space Station, where four astronauts, private astronauts, will spend two weeks on the International Space Station. You know, these are totally, totally different times where space is really opening up for non-governmental astronauts. So in terms of where we're going, uh, one of the things I'm most excited about, uh, I am a geologist, and uh, we're going to go back to the moon and hopefully, you know, actually go there to stay this time. Uh, perhaps eventually set up research stations like we have in Antarctica and keep learning about the moon, its place in the solar system and learning about the early part of Earth's history, which we hope is preserved on the surface of the moon. And so this is a, a NASA slide um, that talks about Artemis that you may have heard about in the news. And this is how we're going to go back to the moon. We're already making the first baby steps. Um, Artemis 1 will be launching in the next, potentially the next year. And for Canada, I think one of the most exciting things, uh, you know, at least in my lifetime, was the announcement that on Artemis 2, there will be a Canadian astronaut on board. So this is going to be the first spacecraft to go back to the moon with humans on uh, since 1972. This first Artemis 2 mission is not going to land, but it's going to do like Apollo 8 did, go into orbit around the moon, uh, circle it for a few days, and then fly back to the Earth. So that iconic moonrise image We'll kind of have a new version of that, uh, hopefully taken by a Canadian astronaut. And so one of these uh, four astronauts um, will be, you know, uh, flying, taking that ride. Uh, they haven't announced it yet. They actually haven't announced, you know, anything about that particular crew. But one of these four astronauts will be doing that. And uh, one of the most, you know, uh, one of the fun things about uh, my, my job here at Weston and uh, where I just actually came back from uh, last week from Northern Labrador has been helping actually train these astronauts, you know, so as a university prof, of course, I get to teach students of all different ages and levels going to schools, um, but our kind of training of the next generation also extends here at Weston to Canadian and US astronauts. And so I've had the pleasure of taking uh, all three, three of these four astronauts so far into the field to teach them geology. Uh, this is NASA's selected uh, uh, 18 Artemis astronauts. So out of its entire core, NASA has selected these uh, 18 astronauts uh, to be the first to go back to the moon. And again, uh, here uh, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of teaching uh, eight of these actually. Uh, these are the newest recruits. They only became astronauts two years ago. 
So it's pretty amazing for them that they've already been selected for these uh, next missions. And so again, um, uh, we've had a lot of uh, impacts due to COVID, um, but just a couple of weeks ago, I found myself up in Northern Labrador, uh, getting into the field for the first time uh, in a couple of years. And uh, they probably don't look quite like they did in the previous images, um, but this is Josh Kutrick to the left of the Western flag and Matthew Dominic on the right, uh, so Canadian and US astronaut. So this is two weeks ago. And yes, that is snow on the ground, uh, freshly laying up there in uh, Northern Labrador. And we were up there exploring a meteorite impact crater that formed about 30 million years ago. And it's an excellent analog uh, for the moon, the types of rocks the astronauts will find on the moon. And so we have this great training ground here in Canada uh, where we might actually see all of the astronauts who are going to the moon uh, come to that crater uh, up in northern Labrador and perhaps actually come back to Weston. And uh, we were discussing this with Matt and Josh that they'll hopefully actually be making a trip here to Weston to look at the samples uh, that we collected and you know to fully understand uh, why, why we collect samples and uh, the importance of samples. And just in case you're wondering, they're both fighter pilots, you know, so this is geology is quite new to them. And so that's why we've got to start this training early for returning to the moon. So, you know, when we think of space exploration, uh, a lot of people think there's a big disconnect uh, between space exploration, you know, Earth observation and taking care of our planet. Um, but I actually disagree. Um, you know, these are a couple of iconic images that uh, really drive, um, you know, and bring home how precious and delicate our planet, planet Earth is. And it's no accident that, you know, the image on the right uh, is the, the emblem of Earth Day. In fact, the first Earth Day occurred in 1970, just after, you know, uh, a few months after the first Apollo landing. And in talking to many astronauts, I have never met one and never read anything about one that wasn't truly moved about their experience up in space, even if it was only for a few hours, like some of these recent private astronauts. I think, it, you know, it'd be great if we could take all 7 billion of us up into space get everyone to look down and actually realize that, uh, you know, we're on this planet together and uh, that we need to preserve what we have here. So that kind of segues into, you know, a lot of what we do in space is actually not looking outwards, exploring outwards, but it's actually looking downwards. And I know Danielle is going to talk a lot of, uh, more about, you know, Earth and uh, what's happening to our planet uh, in the next talk. Um, so satellites, you know, a lot of what we're doing here at Western and uh, in Canada has been building satellites to observe the Earth uh, to monitor our planet. Um, this was Canada's uh, first satellite, Alouette 1, that some of you may have heard of. And uh, in case you didn't know, uh, and actually I didn't know until I started working at the Canadian Space Agency, but with the launch of this satellite in 1962, Canada was actually the third country in space. So if you take anything away from today's talk, maybe it's that one, which is a good kind of trivial pursuit moment. So after Russia, the United States, Canada, out of all countries uh, in the world, was actually the third to launch something into space. So we can be proud of that. And we've had, you know, a long history in space already. Um, so actually, the title of this talk was something that I, I borrowed from uh, this outreach initiative that we, we lead here at Western called uh, Space Matters. And in this, you know, we're trying to bring home how really space, uh, in particular today, pervades as all aspects of our everyday life. And so, you know, the importance of satellites, um, you know, first, a quick definition, it's an object, moon or planet that orbits the sun or a planet. Of course, when typically, and when I'm saying the word satellite here, we're talking about a machine orbiting our Earth. And, you know, satellites are incredibly important. Why do we need satellites? Um, well, if you were coming to campus, you know, perhaps you would have used Google Maps or something, you know, use a satellite imagery. Every time you make a bank transaction, that involves a satellite. And so we don't really realize how, um, you know, important space is for, you know, almost every aspect of our everyday lives. Of course, space um, is more and more important um, for, for, for giving us that big picture overview for monitoring things. There's a network of satellites, including Canada's radar sat constellation that are kind of on standby 24 hours a day, seven days a week for monitoring and providing disaster relief. And uh, of course, monitoring uh, for climate change. Smart agriculture, you know, farmers now are using satellite imagery to decide, you know, which fields to water, uh, how the crops are growing. And so there's just so much application of space-based data now that we never had even a decade ago. 
And so um, just kind of starting to wrap up in a few slides, um, I want to actually show you one of the activities that we actually do in schools, um, but it's hopefully something that all of you at some point in your life remember doing, which is this, you know, this change image, you know, there's two images and it takes a while sometimes, you know, to look at both of these images and, and, and see what is different between the two images. So satellites, because we've had, you know, continuous coverage of the Earth uh, going back decades now, in particular from the United States Landsat satellites, enables us to look back through time and, you know, to see what's happening at the present day. And, you know, I, I actually think it's only in space-based images that we truly realize, you know, how our planet is changing. Um, because you just need to take that giant step back uh, up into Earth orbit and look back down at the Earth. I'm sure you've maybe seen images like this, but this, for example, is the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan. It was once the largest kind of inland uh, body of water uh, on Earth, or one of them. And, you know, between 1986 and 2018, partly due to climate change, but because of uh, diversion of water for irrigation, it's essentially a tiny little remnant of its once uh, vast former self. We look at, look at urbanization, and in fact, if you look at images of London just over the past couple of decades, you'll notice that you know the city is growing out. We're losing farmland uh, and tree land around our city, and you know on a much bigger and more drastic scale, uh, these three images are from three different years um, of the Amazon rainforest. And so, if you're not too familiar in looking at images, you know you can start to describe what you see. These are uh, cuts here. You know these are roads coming in. Uh, these are refields now, and so from 1984 to 2018, this area of the Brazilian rainforest is almost entirely gone. There's little remnants of it uh, from 2018 around the outside. You know, so we get students to think about, you know, what caused this, what does this tell us, and uh, and why this is important. So coming back to this Hubble space image, um, you know, why space matters, I think, to all of us is is actually quite individual. You know, for some of us, it might be exploration. It's a natural extension of us exploring uh, the Earth. It's that perspective, you know, looking down, uh, learning about our own planet and looking back on it from a vast distance. It's answering big questions. You know, uh, a whole of the talk today would just be more planetary science focused about, you know, all of these big picture questions. You know, the biggest to me, which is, are we alone in the universe? Well, you know, in our lifetimes, I hope We'll get that answered, um, whether it's the exploration of Mars, uh, even in our own solar system. You know, with Mars sample return on the horizon in a couple of years, we should have samples from Mars to answer this question for that planet. We've got missions going to some of these cool moons around Jupiter and Saturn that we think have liquid water oceans. And so we might have some answers to these big questions uh, in the next few years. Um, you know, some people um, would think, you know, for long term human survival, we need to get off this planet and uh, or at least have a, something established on another a planetary object. New technology. Um, space is really an innovation driver, you know, designing something to withstand the extreme temp temperatures, pressures, radiation of space is an innovation driver. And then we have those spin-offs. So, you know, here in Canada, the Canada Arm technologies we're very well known for. And it was technologies translated from the development of the Canada Arm that gave us robotic brain surgery, uh, first pioneered in uh, Calgary um, over a decade ago now. Um, we've talked about this, and I think, you know, this is a big driver of why we need to be up in space, and it's protecting and understanding the planet that we live on. Um, we have a new economy. It's perhaps surprising to you to think about that, but space is a new economy. You know, the fact that you can buy a ticket now to fly into space means that we have an economy there, and there are actually economic drivers for returning to the moon. International collaboration is a big one. As I mentioned, the International Space Station. We've had uh, astronauts from various countries, uh, Russia in particular, that you know we have actually had fairly bad diplomatic ties to uh, on and off over the last couple of decades, but we've had uh, an international crew living, working together on the International Space Station for 21 years now. And we're gonna be doing this when we return to the moon. And perhaps, you know, the last one that might be most important if you have young kids is inspiration. You know, uh, inspiring us to do, do the best that we can uh, to get kids, uh, youth interested in science, technology, engineering, and math in the first place using space as a hook. And that's one of the goals of that Space Matters initiative that I talked about. And so I'm gonna wrap up, um, leave you with this, uh, you know, absolutely amazing image.
Um, this is Saturn, if you're trying to figure out what is on the screen here. Uh, this is an image, not this exact image, a similar one taken by the Voyager spacecraft where Carl Sagan's uh, pale blue dot um, idea came from. So if you ever heard him uh, narrate uh, um, part of uh, the cosmos, um, that is us, where that little arrow is, all of us, you know, seven or eight billion of us on planet Earth out there in the solar system. And um, I think to me, this is, you know, an amazing driver for exploring and uh, learning about our Earth in parallel. And so with that, uh, I will end here and uh, I think hand back to Matt and then Danielle. Thank you, Oz, for a very inspiring talk. Uh, and I am hoping that we may have some questions. Remember, if you have a question, just send me a, me <clears throat> a message in the chat. Well, to maybe to warm things up, I have a question. When you were out in Labrador with the uh, Canadian and the American fighter pilot who are gonna become astronauts, um, and you were showing them impact craters there, how will that help them on, on the moon to, uh, how, how will that field trip you took them on translate into their, their mission? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, part of it is just teaching them the science of geology. And so, you know, they did get a little bit of training during their basic two year qualification to become an astronaut. Um, but, you know, I think we all know that we've got to con continue learning uh, and uh, keep up the process of learning uh, through over the years. Um, but the reason why we went to this particular site was also that we have a meteorite impact crater. And when you look at the moon, impact craters are the most dominant landform on the surface. And so, you know, everywhere we go on the moon, you'll either be walking in or around impact craters. And so learning about this geological phenomenon that we actually don't typically uh, teach about too much, because there are relatively few examples here on Earth, these types of craters dominate the, uh, the, the, the landscape of, of the moon. And then on top of that, we actually have uh, in Labrador, I would say the most unique and best lunar analog uh, impact crater anywhere in the world. Because not only is it relatively well preserved so we can see the rocks and touch them like they'll see on the moon, but it formed in a rock type called an orthosite. And this is this white rock that actually is the lunar highlands. And this Mastastin Lake crater is actually one of only two perhaps three craters in the world that have any of this particular rock type. So there's a whole bunch of things that confluenced uh, to, to take me up to Labrador with these astronauts. And, and again, they're gonna be our proxy. You know, right now, um, this will be like the early Apollo missions where there were not geologists on the flights. And so, you know, we have to train up these astronauts to bring back the best samples that they can for, you know, the rest of us to study here on Earth. Perfect, thank you. And a bunch of questions are now coming in from the chat. Um, and so the, the first one is from Robert McKean, and uh, he would like to know what year Ar Artemis II is going to fly to the moon. What year? <laughs> it's a bit of a crystal ball exercise right now because there are um, there's a couple of delays in the pipeline uh, in the U.S. One is the rocket that they're going to use. Um, NASA is actually designing this right now, although there is some discussion that they might actually switch to one of the SpaceX uh, Starliner rockets, and then they've actually had delays in the spacesuit too. So it was meant to happen actually later this year. Um, I definitely do not think that's, uh, sorry, not this year, 2022. I think uh, realistically 2023. Um, so, you know, we're still only talking a couple of years out, um, but it's, yeah, not uh, perhaps quite as soon as we all hoped. And will the crew of Artemis II be responsible for taking samples to bring back? And what will they look for in gathering those samples if so? Yeah, great questions. I wish it was. Uh, this is going to be a mission that is just going to go to the moon, uh, go into orbit around the moon, you know, take lots of imagery and collect data of the surface. Um, but we don't even have a robotic sample return capability for that mission. Um, there was going to be an architecture to do that, um, but that was uh, unfortunately fell by the wayside a few years ago. So we're going to have to wait for Artemis 3 uh, to be the first mission to land back on the surface of the moon. And there we'll actually have astronauts, not robots, collecting samples and uh, bringing them back to Earth. And that question was from Sarah. Laurie Ann Kirby would like to know if, uh, if you had the opportunity to be a space tourist, would you go? 
Uh, absolutely, for sure. You know, um, I used to think about becoming an astronaut, you know, a few years ago and, uh, you know, two and a half year missions to Mars, I don't think uh, I would sign up for, but, you know, a few days in space, I think I would definitely take that opportunity if I could uh, be offered it now. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, one more question from Andre LaRoche. Uh, could you speculate on the type of biological organisms that could be identified in space? Great question. You know, I think well, it, we're, we only have one data point now, which is life on Earth. And so, you know, a lot of effort goes into looking at microbial life on it. So it's going to be microbial. It's going to be microscopic life, perhaps the type of life that lives in some of these extreme environments on Earth and hot springs or very salty uh, oceanic environments. And uh, so I think, you know, we, we know that these environments did exist on Mars because we see evidence of them from orbit and from the rovers. And so, you know, on Earth, it's actually really hard to prove that we had ancient life when you get a rock sample in your hand. And so let alone just from the perspective of a rover. So that's why we're bringing back samples from Mars, hopefully in a few years time, uh, for the first time from known locations. So microscopic uh, microbial life, perhaps akin to, you know, what we see in hot spring environments here on Earth would be my best guess um, to that question. So Samana Samavi has a question that I'd like to merge with one of my own. Uh, Oz, we know that you're one of our most fit faculty members, but I'm, I'm guessing those, uh, those fighter pilots are also pretty fit individuals. And Samana's question is how long an astronaut has to train physically in order to go on a mission? Uh, you know, I think that's changed since the days of Apollo when, you know, and, and you look at Mercury and Gemini and Apollo, those astronauts were really chosen almost primarily a because there were test pilots most of them and because they were you know physically at the top of their you know they were in the top percentile kind of things but it, it, that's that's become less of a, a focus in recent years not saying that any of the astronauts are unfit you know they're all of course you've got to be fit and healthy to fly in space so that your body can withstand the rigors of being in space but you don't have to be superhuman anymore um, and i think also for private space missions uh, this is what I think is so amazing about this, right? Uh, Inspiration Four. If you were following it along, um, there was uh, a cancer, you know, a cancer survivor and an amputee. They would never qualify to be a government astronaut, but uh, thanks to you know private space missions, uh, uh, she was able to fly in space on the Inspiration Four space mission. So, um, yeah, you know it. It, you need to be healthy enough to with, for your body to withstand the rigors of space, but uh, don't have to be a superhero. Perfect. Um, I'm just going to uh, now maybe just ask you to talk just a tiny bit about the work you do with, with our youngest people um, in the outreach and the Space Matters and so on. Maybe just for one minute, because then we, I'd like to get to Danny. Yeah, so, it, you know, I think um, it's incredible. I love that aspect of my job, you know, basically trying to inspire, uh, in particular, you know, elementary through high school students to pursue careers in, in science, technology, engineering, and math. We know that as, especially as kids enter high school, they, they lose interest in this. And so a lot of what we do is to use space as a hook. You know, a lot of kids, especially elementary school, you know, you can talk about space and you can make uh, lots, of, lots of topics uh, interesting. Uh, if you get, get them involved in, or use that hook of space. And so we have quite an active, uh, you know, there's lots of active outreach here in the Faculty of Science. It's something that I know a lot of our faculty are passionate about. And so we you know, develop resources for teachers. We run workshops for teachers. You know, we've been relegated to doing virtual presentations in schools and things the last couple of years, but we're usually fairly active going into classrooms and things too. And so, yeah, we have some great programs, you know, not just in the Institute, but throughout the Faculty of Science where, you know, hopefully we're making a difference. And uh, I think it's actually important, you know, to communicate our science to, to the general public too. Um, you know, not a lot of people will ever read the papers that you, I, and Danny publish, um, but by sharing them on social media or through other instances and communicating that science to a public, uh, you know, it becomes much uh, broader and hopefully better understood and a more educated um, you know, Canadian public. Perfect. Well, thank you again, Oz, for that really inspiring lecture. And uh, we're now going to move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Danny Way.
And Danny's an associate professor in our Department of Biology, and she's the director of the Biotron Experimental Climate Change Research Center. Danny's a member of the College of the Royal of the New College of the of the Royal Society of Canada, uh, and she is an extremely impactful researcher. And in fact, um, there's a thing called a highly cited researcher. It's a technical sort of bibliometrics term, and Danny's one of those. Um, and I'm really thrilled that Danny's going to have a chance to uh, to share some of her really important work on the impact of climate change on Canada's forests and crops. Take it away, Danny. Thank you so much. Um, let me just pull this up and make sure everything's working okay. So does that, the slide looks okay? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thanks, Matt. So thanks very much for that introduction, Matt. Um, and I just want to say I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with all of you. I'm sorry we can't do this in person. Um, but thanks for, thanks for coming to Western's homecoming and, and thanks for attending these talks. Um, and also thanks to Oz for pointing out, you know, some of the ties that we have between things like the space observation and this, the type of work that I'm going to be talking about with, with climate change today. Let me just kind of get going. All right. So I'm sure many of you in the audience are, are well aware that CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere are increasing, right? And they're increasing because we're burning fossil fuels and, and through land use change like deforestation. And, you know, I think you often don't actually get to see those numbers. And so these are, this is a graph just showing how much CO2 is in the atmosphere on, on the y-axis here, on this axis. And then over time, we only started measuring this back in the late 1950s. Um, so these are measurements that are made out in Hawaii where the air is quite pristine, relatively speaking. Um, and you can see that over that time, I was born in 1976. Um, and so, you know, at that point, CO2 was sitting around 330 parts per million. And we're now up at around 420 parts per million. And there's certainly no evidence that that's going to be slowing down. And indeed, CO2 is actually already 50% greater than it was before the Industrial Revolution when we started burning fossil fuels on, on a large scale. And so that increase in CO2 and greenhouse gases has actually already increased global temperatures by about one degree Celsius. So, you know, you hear a lot of things about the Paris Agreement, about keeping warming below two degrees Celsius or two and a half degrees Celsius. Um, we're already in a future warmer world. And if we continue on the types of trajectory that we're on, um, then this is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, predicts for the end of this century. The fact that globally we would have warming of sort of three to four degrees Celsius, and you can see the different colors indicate the degree of warming you're seeing in different parts of the, the planet. So this sort of orange color is what you're seeing, broadly speaking. But places in high latitudes, places like Canada and, and the Arctic, um, these areas are warming much more rapidly. And so you can see that by the end of the century, certain parts of the Arctic could be about 11 or 12 degrees warmer if we just continue um, burning fossil fuels and making the types of changes that we're making right now. And that's an enormous shift for the planet. So I'm really interested in the interaction between climate and plants for a couple of different reasons. And I think most of you, especially if you do gardening and, and you pay attention to what you can plant here in London and, and what you see as you drive across the country, you're very well aware that climate affects plants, right? It's a really important control on where you find different species, where they're distributed, and also how productive they are if they grow well. So this is a figure showing currently where you can find aspen. This is a really common boreal tree species. So the dark green area sort of shows the core of its range where, where you find most of this. And the sort of paler green color shows the full extent of where it grows naturally. But under climate change, again, under these types of changes we might expect, by the end of the century, you'd actually expect that the core of this range is now up in those areas that Oz just showed you, right? We're up in the Arctic. Um, and in fact, part of this range would just disappear into the Arctic Ocean. Um, so these are enormous shifts that we're expecting in the type, where the types of plants that we really care about are going to be growing in the future. But I think people are often less aware of the fact that not only does climate affect plants, but also that plants affect climate. Okay, so if we go back to just looking at sort of now just these upper latitudes, these high latitude regions of that, that projection I showed you, these projections of what the climate's going to look like in the future don't just account for the amount of CO2 we emit as humans, but also the CO2 that's being taken up and emitted by plants across the whole planet. And so these sorts of exchanges with the atmosphere, these what we call fluxes, those really include um, two really big elements from plants. And the first is photosynthesis. You may remember that from, from high school or from your, your university courses. And that's just where plants absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere. Right? But plants just like us actually also emit CO2. So every time you breathe out, your breath is full of CO2 uh, from your metabolism. 
and plants also emit CO2 through that same process. So they do both. And the way that that affects our climates is kind of shown here in a really simplified version, where here I'm just showing you some basic numbers from what we call the global carbon cycle. So in other words, the movement of carbon throughout our planet um, in, in a year. And so plants every year absorb 123 billion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. It's by far the biggest drawdown and the biggest absorption of, of carbon um, that, that you get on a global, global scale. And this is just land plants. So we're talking just about land plants here. About half of that is then re-emitted by plants back into the atmosphere. And animals and microbes and soil processes, just like us breathing out, also emit about another 60 billion tons of carbon every year on the, on the planet. And these, these numbers roughly balance out normally. But of course, humans are also emitting a lot of carbon through industrial processes and, and land use change. And that means that you're accumulating, in this scenario, about 7 billion tons of carbon every year in the atmosphere. That's that rising CO2 that we just, we just talked about. But the implication is also that if you move into a warmer, oh, there we go, a warmer, drier climate in the future, plants might not absorb as much carbon. So if this number goes down from 123 to 120 billion tons of carbon being absorbed by plants every year, even if they also release a little bit less and we don't do anything else that's different, you suddenly go from building up 7 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere every year to building up nine. In other words, climate change will happen more rapidly if plants don't absorb as much carbon in the future as they do now. So understanding how plants absorb carbon and these sorts of processes, how much they grow, how much they can sequester, is really important for actually predicting where we're going with our climate. So I know I use the term photosynthesis and often people are a little bit, oh, that, that's a bit scary. What is that? I last heard that in high school. Um, and so I just wanna give you a really simplified version of what I'm talking about for this process. So photosynthesis is where plants and leaves specifically absorb light, energy from the sun, and they use that with water and, and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to make sugar. And then that sugar is used for metabolism and growth. So if you take a leaf like this and you sort of turn it on its side and you cut through it, you get a cross section of a leaf. So this is the top of the leaf looking at the inside. And so there are two main processes that we're gonna sort of think about. The first is that CO2 has to diffuse into the leaf. So it has to get from the air inside the leaf. And it does that through these little holes, these little pores that are called stomata, okay? And stoma just means mouth in Greek. So it, it comes from little, these little mouths on the surface of the leaf. And then at that point, the CO2, once it's inside, has to actually be fixed by enzymes. It has to be fixed by the biochemistry inside a leaf. And that's where it's turned into sugar and then used for, for metabolism. And that process is related to how much nitrogen there is in a leaf. So how well fertilized it is basically. And, and also its ability to fix that CO2 and take that CO2 up. So those are the sort of main two processes we're gonna think of. CO2 has to get in and then it has to be used inside the leaf. So here at Western, uh, Matt mentioned that I'm the director of the Biotron Center for Experimental Climate Change Research. And this is uh, a picture of this phenomenal facility from the inside. So here's a picture of these rooftop glass houses that we have at the Biotron, where we're doing experiments looking at how major species in Canada's northern forests respond to future climates. And you can see here, this is a paper birch. These are, these are all grown from seeds. So these were really tiny when we started. You can see these very small conifers here. These are little spruce trees, little, little baby pine trees. Um, and these are some of my lab members taking a look and starting to make the measurements that we're doing in our lab here. And what we're doing specifically is to actually grow these plants under future climate change. So the idea is, we can compare plants that are grown either at current CO2s or future CO2s, and also combine that with current temperatures, warming, so this is sort of a moderate warming, plus four, what we might expect by the end of the century if, if we make um, a lot of mitigation to our CO2 emissions. And then this plus eight, which is sort of a business as usual type scenario for these higher latitudes. And then we can compare plants that are grown under current climates and those that are grown under future climates to see how they differ. Do they absorb less carbon? Do they absorb more carbon? How well do they survive, for example? So I'm gonna show you a little bit of that data and just sort of walk you through that, uh, a few of our major findings. And so I talked to you about how nitrogen is a really important part of, of, of the ability of a plant to absorb CO2. And in fact, a lot of these large scale models that are used by things like the um, IPCC, that Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, actually use nitrogen as a proxy for how much CO2 a plant can take up. So what I'm showing you here is the amount of nitrogen, the concentration inside a leaf. And this is for two major species, black spruce, 
which is probably the most common tree in the North American boreal forest. Um, and then we're gonna also look at some data from tamarack, which is a deciduous tree. Um, and so there's these six treatments that we're using, ambient CO2 here on the left, and then plants grown at elevated CO2 here on the right um, with the hashtags, okay? And then blue represents plants grown at cool current conditions. Purple is sort of that moderate warming and the red is the extreme warming. You can see that as you warm the growth environment of the plants, they have less nitrogen. So they're probably less able to absorb CO2. And we find that both in this, this very common species, black spruce, and we see something very similar in tamarack where the plants grown at these higher temperatures have lower nitrogen concentrations. And the implication of that is that if you have less nitrogen in these warm grown trees, that should mean they have lower enzyme content inside them. So they'll be less able to fix CO2. Okay. So we then went and looked at that ability to fix CO2 in these different plants. So this is just an index here of, of the maximum ability to fix CO2 when the plant has lots of water and lots of light and everything else. Um, and here again, we're looking at data for, for that really common species black spruce. These are trees that are grown at ambient CO2 and we've measured this across a range of different leaf temperatures to see if temperature affects that, that performance. The key thing here is really to look at the fact that the blue line is always over the purple line and the purple line's above the red line. In other words, as you warm the environment of the plant, the ability to fix CO2, to continue to take CO2 out of the atmosphere is suppressed, okay? And we see that regardless of whether we grow them at current CO2 or future CO2. And we see that actually in both of these species where you can see the blue line always has the highest ability to fix CO2. And so what this means is that if you grow plants in, in these warmer conditions that we expect for the future, they're less capable of absorbing CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, and we're not really seeing much of an effect of that, of the growth CO2 that, that we're looking at here as well. So I'm just gonna, I know you guys probably can't actually say anything back. I would normally ask you at this point, if I, if, if I have plants that have less nitrogen and they're less able to fix CO2, how much CO2 do you think they actually fix? And I think the answer you know, that we'd expect is that if you have less ability to fix CO2, you, you take up less CO2 from the atmosphere. And that is what we see for this black spruce. So here's where we're looking at just not their maximum ability to fix CO2, but what they actually do just sort of when they're growing in the greenhouses. And here for black spruce, these are plants that are grown at current CO2. And again, you can see that the blue line is highest. In other words, they're taking up a lot of CO2 compared to the plants that are growing at these plus four or plus eight warming treatments. So they really are absorbing less CO2. We see that in both, both of these treatments. But in contrast, this other species, this deciduous species, tamarack, these curves are very much the same. So despite the fact that the plants have less ability to take up CO2 from the atmosphere, they're actually still performing the same. They're, 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 they have the same photosynthetic rate. And the question is, why can that happen? Why can that happen in these trees? And so if we go back to thinking about this, these processes I talked to you about, the first couple of slides where we see that plants are less able to fix CO2 is this. And so across most of the species that we look at from Canada's Northern forests, the ability to fix CO2 inside the tissues is suppressed in plants that grow at warm temperatures. In other words, they're not gonna be doing as well in the future. They're not gonna absorb as much carbon. There's gonna be less sugar from metabolism and growth. But some of these plants, what they do is they actually open those little mouths, those stomata open a little bit more widely and allow more CO2 in. And so by doing that, they can help offset and, and minimize the effect of this suppression of the biochemistry inside their leaves. And so that's what we sort of see when we look at, at these two species here. We look at how open their stomata are, how open those little pores are. And in black spruce, that species that isn't doing very well at warmer conditions, the plants from the cool conditions from current atmospheric CO2, current, current temperatures, the blue lines here, those have really high amounts of CO2 that can filter into the leaf, okay? So in other words, under warming, less CO2 gets into the leaf and on top of it, there's less biochemistry inside the leaf that can take that CO2 up and fix it and turn it to sugar. In contrast, in tamarack, this deciduous species, it's quite the opposite. The plants that are grown at warmer conditions basically try to adjust their anatomy and their behavior in a way to increase the amount of CO2 that gets inside the leaf so that they're not quite as, as, as carbon limited under these warmer growth conditions. And you can see that because it's here, they have the plants with the highest stomatal conductance, the highest ability to move CO2 in are those grown at these warmest conditions, the red lines. That ability to fix CO2, as I mentioned, 
plays into how much growth and, and the survival of these sorts of plants. Right? And so what we see is across a broad suite of these boreal species that growth correlates with the ability to, to maintain that ability to fix CO2. And so here's five different species from the boreal forest. These are, this encompasses basically the majority of the species you'll find in North America's boreal forest. And what you have here is pictures just showing on the left plants grown at current CO2 and plants on the right that are grown at high CO2 of the future. And then within each of those CO2s, you see this little arrow, you have sort of current temperatures plus four and plus eight, current temperatures plus four plus eight. So you can sort of see this continuum of the treatments. And what I want you to notice is that the plants grown at the warmest temperatures of plus eight on the right-hand sides here are, are much smaller than the plants grown at any of the other temperatures. And that, that's for all of these different species. So plus eight degrees Celsius, although people often think of these high latitude regions as being very cold limited and that, that warming might actually enhance their growth. Instead, what we see is this broad scale suppression of growth. Right? We do see that high CO2 um, tends to benefit growth. And this is something more CO2 means that you have more carbon to turn into sugars, more photosynthesis. And that does usually lead to an increase in growth. So we do see that sort of an effect here. But what I want you to notice is that it's these species like tamarack, which is deciduous that we talked about, and also the birch trees down here, these deciduous species tend to do much better under these sort of moderate warmings. You can see that there's really no decline in growth here between say the, the current temperatures and the plus four um, or up here in the tamarack, those are roughly the same. But in a lot of the other species, what happens is even just warming to plus four, the sort of warming we might expect by the year 2060, for example, um, suppresses the growth of these trees. And what that means is you might also expect to see a transition from a boreal forest that's dominated by these sort of spruce and pine trees, these evergreen conifers, into a forest that's more dominated by things like, like birch and poplar. And that has enormous shifts for, um, enormous implications for sort of the ecosystem processes and, and what that environment's gonna look like and how it's gonna function. On top of that, we also get um, a lot of browning and a lot of death in these warmer treatments. And this is a jack pine seedling. You can sort of see it's, it's established, it's grown, it was nice and bright green, and gradually over time it yellows, it browns, and then they start to die. And you can see that here, here's a, a plant growing at current conditions. This is a spruce tree, and here's one from the plus eight treatments. And so even though these are well watered, they're well fertilized, they have everything they need, um, this is really a best case scenario. Out in the field, of course, these plants experience drought, they experience herbivory, and often they don't have um, all of the nutrients they need. They're not being fertilized out in the field. So the fact that they're still dying under these conditions is really problematic and really worrying. Now, we're, we're looking at not only the growth of these plants in the Biotron here at Western, um, but just to, to make sure that these, these experiments that we're doing on little seedlings um, actually represent how trees and forests will actually respond to climate change. We're also involved in a major uh, experiment down in the States that's called SPRUCE. And that's an acronym uh, for spruce and peatland responses under changing environments. So you can see this, this is a big, big experiment uh, down in Minnesota. It's run by the US Department of Energy. And these are 10 what we call open top chambers. These are basically 13 meters wide um, and about 14 meters tall. And inside them are 40 to 50 year old uh, spruce and tamarack trees. So these are large trees and they're experiencing both current and future CO2, just like in the glass house and warming anywhere between zero and nine degrees Celsius. So very similar to the treatments we've been imposing here at Western. And what I just wanna show you is, is that we see very similar responses in the seedlings we're, do, we're working on here at Western as we do out in the field. So here we have, we're looking at the, that ability to get CO2 into the leaf through those stomata. And here's black spruce, it's that same species we looked at in the glass houses. And as you increase the temperature they experience and also the growth temperature, so the plants growing at high temperatures are here in dark red and the plants growing at current conditions are here in these sort of pale colors, you can see that they start to close those stomata and less CO2 is getting inside the plant. That's what you'd expect actually, because this is a way of conserving water for these plants. But in contrast, that other species tamarack that we've already looked at, as they, you grow them and expose them to these higher temperatures, indeed, they actually open those stomata up and let more CO2 in. And that's facilitating um, their ability to maintain CO2 uptake, photosynthesis, and also growth um, and survival under these, these hot, dry conditions. So I don't think that Canada's forests are gonna look like this anytime soon. 
Um, this is actually a picture of Port Dover, if you're not familiar. So this is actually on Lake Erie. Um, and every summer they take these palm trees that they grow at glass houses and they put them out into the beaches to, to sort of produce a tropical feeling. Um, and so as much as I think as Canadians, we often think maybe global warming wouldn't be so bad. I mean, this looks pretty nice. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to be going here anytime soon. But I do think that these types of um, temperatures, the degree of warming we're going to experience is going to have serious impacts on our forests. And not just on our forests, but also other plants, right? So also the crop species that we rely on for food security. And I just want to give you a couple of brief slides about that, that, you know, I think fewer people are aware of this, that if we want to meet our food security needs as a planet by the year 2050, so, you know, you're only talking about 19 years, 19, yeah, 29 years from now, um, you have to increase food production by about 70%. And that's partly because we have a, a growing population, um, but also because as people get wealthier and the economy improves for, for the vast majority of people who move out of poverty, then the types of food and the amount of food that you eat also shift. And so people tend to eat more meat and eat um, more calories as, as they move out of poverty. And so there's this sort of combined pressure to be able to make more food in the future. But that's already a huge goal. I mean, growing 70% more food on the planet um, is already an enormous challenge. But that challenge has to be met in the face of climate change. And this is a picture of um, a wheat field from, from this past summer out in the prairies here in Canada. You guys probably heard a lot about that, the large heat dome and the drought events that were happening in the prairies. And so being able to grow this amount of food under a climate that is warming and shifting and in many cases really stressing these plants is gonna be an enormous challenge. Um, and so some of the work that, that we're doing here is to, to help to try to identify lines of, of crops like wheat that are resilient to future climates. And so that's in other words, growing them under future CO2 and temperature conditions here in the Biotron, uh, like the work I'm showing you with the trees, and then assessing both how much food they produce and also what quality that food is. And the reason for assessing the quality of the food is that when you grow plants at high CO2, no matter whether you're looking at wheat or rice or maize in this situation, what you tend to see is a suppression of the concentration of micronutrients in them. So things like zinc and iron in wheat, you know, zinc concentrations fall by 9%, iron concentrations fall by 5% on average, and they have less protein. Um, and so this is really a problem when you're thinking about the nutritional status of, of a global population. And this comes about mainly because plants can only use so much sugar, right? Um, it's a little bit like feeding my five-year-old candy, a candy bar at a birthday party. If, if she's only getting sugar, then she's not getting proper nutrition and she doesn't grow well. And it's kind of the same for plants. If you give them a lot of CO2, um, they can sometimes grow bigger, but all that extra sugar that they're producing ends up diluting all of those other nutrients that, that humans rely on for our nutrition. So just to give you a little bit of taste of that, um, you know, one of, the work, one of the pieces of work that we're doing right now um, here at Western is actually growing wheat lines that were released at different periods. So one of them is this, this um, red fife, which was released by breeders in 1842. Um, another one here is Canuck that was released just three years before I was born. And then AEC Starbuck, which is a variety of wheat that was released by Agriculture Canada um, just a couple of years ago. And what we're doing is we're growing these under different CO2 concentrations. So the types of CO2 concentrations you might've seen around the period when red fife was released, uh, current CO2 and also future CO2 levels. And then we're trying to see whether or not there's variation across these lines as we've bred for wheat, perhaps that has um, higher yield, whether perhaps there are traits that we've lost that we might want to get back into breeding programs that might improve, for example, seed quality, yield or growth under future high CO2 conditions to maintain that. So I just wanna wrap up by saying, I, I know that we often think about climate change as something that's coming in the future, but especially here in Canada in these high latitude regions, um, climate change is already here. So we have much higher CO2 than we did in the past. And if you look at just warming since around 1950, this is a map um, showing from, from Environment Canada, showing the degree of warming we've actually already experienced since 1950 in Canada. So, you know, it's not quite as extreme here in London, but even then you're looking at sort of one degree Celsius already. Uh, whereas in these areas in Northern Canada, you're looking at warming that's already experienced, we've already experienced of close to three and a half degrees Celsius. So, you know, we rely a lot on our natural ecosystems and on these managed crop um, ecosystems for producing food and producing the sorts of services that we rely on for clean water and air and also climate regulation. And so I think that this is something that we really need to be working towards to be looking to mitigate 
climate change and mitigate its impacts on our on our systems, as well as adapting these systems so that we can find more resilient, um, make more resilient forests and, and increase food security. So that's all I've got for today. And thank you for being here and listening and I'm happy to get some questions. I think you're muted, Matt. Yes, I am. Someone else, someone has to be muted on every call. Thank you, Danny. That that was uh, fantastic and a very interesting presentation. I am um, able to take questions from the from the, the crowd via chat. If you want to send me a chat message, and maybe just to just to seed seed the chat, uh, I've got a question relating your your earlier slides about. Uh, replacing things like spruce and pine um, with deciduous species um, like birch and poplar. Um, clearly the time scale for doing that is is long, but but would the birch and poplar um, take up more carbon than an equivalent acreage of of the of the of the pine? Yeah, so those sorts of deciduous species usually do take up more carbon. Um, they're active for less of the season though, because they don't keep their leaves out all year round. So there are those sorts of trade-offs that you get. Um, and I think the other thing is that this can happen really rapidly. Like we do tend to think of those things as being slow, but there's a lot of big scale disturbances in Canada's Northern forests. So you get these big fires that we've, we've seen. Um, and also you get a lot of large scale insect outbreaks that kill trees. And then what grows back might be completely different. You know, you might start with a spruce forest and if it burns down and it grows into a poplar stand, then you have a very, very different system. Thank you. Uh, got a question from Diane Wyke. Um, should we be limiting urban growth into rural areas so we don't lose food producing capacity? I think, I think that, yeah, managing our, how we develop our land is a really big challenge. Um, Canada is very lucky that, you know, places like Southern Ontario, we have phenomenal soils and the ability to grow, grow food, which a lot of Canada doesn't. I mean, there's sometimes these implications that food production will simply move north as the climate warms, but um, those areas have, you know, they're very rocky, they don't have good soils, and so you're not actually going to be able to grow food on them. And so I, I do think that maintaining that landscape where we can to be able to produce food is, is probably a smart decision, and sort of that, that ability to intensify where we can the land that we're already using for urban regions. Yeah. Thank you. Next question is from Burns Cheadle. Uh, great talk, Danny. Does any of your research involve collaboration with synthetic biologists to design adaptive food crops? Ah, yes. So um, I have done a little bit of work with some people who um, work on, there's a, a key enzyme, the enzyme that actually fixes CO2 in photosynthesis. Um, and there's some argument that maybe it's actually not um, perfectly adapted to the, the current conditions that we have now. And that if you could improve it, um, that we'd actually be able to increase food production by like 30% if you could get the, a, a version of that enzyme into plants that, that perform better. Um, and so I have done some work with some colleagues who do that. Of course, testing GMOs, um, genetically modified organisms in the field is always uh, a regulatory challenge. Um, but there's some, there is some evidence that there are ways that we can modify um, plant biochemical pathways in ways that reduce the amount of energy that they use for sort of side reactions um, that they don't really need under agriculture when they're being well fertilized and well watered, at least in the North American context. And then we might be able to improve the amount of food that we produce per unit land um, if we were to use those types of plants in the field. But that's stuff that's, yeah, th those are those are the sorts of things that are just sort of really being tested in labs still. Um, and there's there's really nothing for large scale release at this point. Perfect. Uh, Robert McKean asks, overall, will Canada improve food production or not as the average temperature rises? Uh, so there are predictions that, again, you know, it, it is a cold climate, you know, under warming, you expect a longer growing season, so more ability to produce food. Um, but I do think that the problem with climate change is it doesn't occur in a regular fashion, right? It's like seeing things this year, like seeing things burn down in Lytton, BC. I mean, it hit 50, over 50 degrees Celsius. So the problem is as you get this gradual warming, it's not just a, the fact that every day is one degree warmer. That might actually increase crop, crop productivity in Canada, but it's that you fact that you also get these strong heat events and drought events that are then associated with it. And so that that lack of reliability of what the climate's gonna look like is actually, I think, one of the biggest challenges. Um, and so there are areas where I think, you know, from year to year, you will get benefits. But I think overall, the fact that the system is changing and you don't know what you're supposed to plant and when you're supposed to plant it, 
um, and you can't count on that reliable sort of climate, that's going to be one of the major issues. And so I do think you're going to start getting suppression of, of productivity um, over this next like 30 years or so. And I think we'll end with this question that segues into in, uh, us into thinking about next year's homecoming uh, from and Andre Laroche. On a lighter angle, are we going to see many new different tree species on campus by 2050 or 2070? Ah, yeah. So if you are a gardener, it is kind of fun um, in the sense that you can you can certainly plant things that you weren't able to plant, you know, even 20, 50 years ago. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised. We're here at Western. We're actually sort of at a, a, a blending of zones. We're at the very tip of what's known as the Carolinian forest, which by its name, you can probably judge um, includes trees that you grow down in the Carolinas. Um, and so you do have some of those species here on campus. And I would expect that that those more southern species will incre be increased increasingly growing well um, in Southern Ontario over these next uh, next few decades. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So I think at this point we have to we have to cut it. It's it's just past 11 and we we promised you 10 till 11. Uh, but I really thank everyone. Uh, first of all, Danny, I thank you for a great talk and also Oz for your great talk. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I hope we can continue this tradition of, of lectures into future homecomings uh, as we move hopefully back a little bit more into an in-person homecoming experience. Uh, again, I hope everyone has a great homecoming weekend and I will uh, look forward to uh, 